Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you all for joining me um, and for joining each other on what is, um, I hope, a fantastic uh, experience for everybody, though, of course, not as good as in person. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you today about how we get to net zero while strengthening our economy and improving our lives at the same time. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this and framed in the way that I framed this is because, look, I'm a politician. I don't just think of policy, what the right thing is to do. I think of how you persuade people, persuade enough people to agree with that, to go along with it, and to, and to join you with that, on that journey. Uh, because this is a sort of whole societal uh, transformation that can only be achieved with the consent and support of a majority of people. Now, as we do this, we need to think of how we get to net zero while strengthening our economy. So improving the livelihoods of most people and improving our lives. And what I mean by that most broadly is improving the way we live, improving the quality of our air, improving the quality of our communities, uh, improving the connections and the cohesiveness of, of the people we live around. And so if we can do those two things, then I think we will be able to get to net zero in a way that gets the support of most people. Uh, so I want to focus really on, on three aspects of this. The first is I think we need to rewire our industrial base. The second is the government needs to put its full weight behind nuclear power and wind energy, though the way it does that depends um, on, on its uh, individual type of renewable. And the third and the trickiest one is I think we need to shift the tax burden in quite an aggressive way over the coming years. So the first is on rewiring our industrial base. There's a book that's, um, it's, it's an e-book, it's, it's out in the United States and I was listening to the author on a podcast and the book is called Rewiring America. And in effect, what that author proposes is that we effectively have to electrify absolutely everything we can. So from today, what the government needs to be thinking about, what industry needs to be thinking about is how do we, in every area that we can, electrify our processes? That's heating, that's obviously transport, that's um, so many different aspects of our lives that currently uh, may not be fully electrified. We need to do that as soon as possible. Now, I don't think many people will necessarily disagree with that. The difficulty is how do you achieve it? Private finance is critically important, as we know. And again, I'm a conservative. I believe in the market economy. I believe in the power of markets to achieve great things. Yet at the same time, the public sector needs to play a very key role. Now, that key role, if you're trying to electrify almost everything you can, needs to bridge the gap between what the private sector will fund at any particular point and what people want to do. Because ultimately, if it is too expensive for an industry or a company, a company or an individual or a family to electrify their lives to the extent possible, then people won't do it. So the public sector needs to, first of all, do everything from a regulatory perspective and a tax perspective, et cetera, to encourage as much private sector capital to go into that, but needs to also recognize that private sector capital is not enough. And the public sector needs to, first of all, set very high standards and very exacting standards. So for example, having a very, I'd say we should maybe move forward the date from which electric cars should be you know, mandatory on, on sale of new electric cars rather than new petrol and diesel cars. That will help private sector get the confidence to invest more in developing electric vehicles and bringing the cost down. But also the public sector is going to have to help fund a lot of this. And at the moment, this is not necessarily the most popular thing to say because we're spending so much money on the COVID recovery more broadly, uh, or managing COVID, should I say, more broadly, that it is 
difficult to ask the Treasury, look, you know, we just need a few more billion to do to do various things. But I'm afraid that we need to think of an innovative way of structuring this so that the public sector does play its part. The private sector will do the, the lion's share of the heavy lifting, but the public sector will need to play its part in helping to electrify. And the two areas I think I repeat are key are transport, which provides a considerable amount of emissions that we domestically produce in this country, and heating. What I might also say alongside heating, as we all know, is, is insulation of buildings and houses. And I won't you know, go on about that because I think the point is people appreciate the point. But there's no point improving your heating systems if you're not improving the, re the retaining of that heat within buildings. So I think that these are all things that we need to do. The second is to put government's weight behind nuclear and wind energy. Now, wind, frankly, has had a good 10 years, at least, of government being really, really supportive. We are really the wind energy capital of Europe. Uh, and I hope we'll continue to be so. And we need to keep moving further onto that. How will that improve our economy? Uh, well, it creates jobs whenever you, you put new wind, whether it be onshore or offshore. But also, the technologies that are created and developed can then be exported to other countries in the world that may not be where we are on that wind journey. So not only are we helping from a global perspective climate change, we're helping British business. So I think that we need to, we need to do that and we need to to continue to put government's weight behind it and see how we can help businesses export their technologies and their wind, wind energy um, ability to other countries. The second is nuclear. Now, many of you, if not all of you, will be aware of the upcoming decision on Sizewell. Uh, it, I've been very clear in public and in private with the business secretary, the chancellor, um, uh, everybody in parliament that it is key that the government, I believe, puts its weight behind nuclear energy. And there are some people that regard this as somehow controversial. They believe that we don't need baseload energy anymore and that we can just use wind and hydroelectric and wave power, etc. And I, and I have sympathy with that view because nuclear power does have problems, we all know, with the, with the issue of waste. However, it is a renewable energy it provides very constant, high degree, predictable energy over a very long period of time. And it creates significant numbers of jobs, often in parts of the country, where we're having the most decarbonisation. So, you know, I think of my own constituency, Hitchin and Hutton, which is really the, the green rural bit between Luton and Stevenage in, in Hertfordshire. My constituents are mostly work in the service sector, services sector, for example. It's a very wealthy constituency. People are well off. They have, broadly speaking, um, you know, people are the, the, they're, they're highly skilled. They, they are winners in the new economy. There are certain parts of this country, I think of parts of Cumbria, for example, where my colleague Judy Harrison is the MP in Copeland, where the nuclear, the nuclear industry is the bedrock of, of the local economy. And there are other parts of the country, I think of the coastal areas around Sizewell and Suffolk, where having an expansion of nuclear energy will provide significant numbers of long-term, highly skilled, highly paid jobs uh, where they don't currently exist. And in parts of the Midlands and the North, more broadly, in areas where we're having to decarbonize to get rid of our fossil fuel energy, having nuclear, I think is so key as, as effectively an economic replacement for those jobs and doing that in a net zero way. So for me, the government needs to put fall, fall squarely behind nuclear energy and back it. And I hope that the decision which I'm um, told is due to come out soon, um, hopefully imminently, on Sizewell, I hope we didn't just stop at Sizewell, we should probably do a couple more as well because it should actually look at the the um, decommissioning of old fossil fuel uh, power stations over the coming years, unless we do nuclear in the coming years, we've got real trouble in terms of generating enough electricity as well. And if we don't do that, by the way, that will undermine our whole efforts on the net zero agenda because people will say, you can't even keep the lights on. So I think it's absolutely key we do nuclear. So first thing is rewire our industrial base, uh, electrify everything, as I put it, 
and the second is put government full square behind nuclear and wind energy. The third and final point is we need to shift the tax burden. And what I mean by this, and I speak as somebody who was, uh, was in the city of London, I worked in finance uh, for the 10 years or so before I became a member of parliament. The, we need to move much more aggressively on saying there are certain behaviors that are damaging to the environment, whether it be the type of uh, vehicle that's driven in, whether it be private or, or in industry, uh, or whether it be the type of energy generation, or whether it even just be the way how people are treating our green spaces. Those behaviors should be taxed considerably more, and that will help in the short term with raising revenue, and then in the medium term with changing behavior. A bit like how we did, for example, the plastic bag tax, which at the time seemed quite radical, but now you know, the, the reduction in the amount of plastic bags that are used is quite considerable. And it was a really comparatively small tax that actually raised a bit of money and changed behavior. So I think we need to do that a lot more. But correspondingly, we need to reduce the tax and increase the incentive on good behaviors, on things that we want people to be doing. If we want people, so for example, road pricing, rather than the system of road tax that we have now, we need to be looking at road pricing. So if you are driving less and you're cycling more or walking more in your local community, you will pay less for your car in terms of tax terms than somebody who's driving all the time. At the moment, you pay road tax and, and, you, and you can effectively drive as much or as little as you like. We need to start shifting that to encourage the right behaviors. And, and if we do this, uh, I think that we will raise quite a lot of revenue because there will be areas where people will be slow to change behaviors and use that revenue directly into pushing into the things that we want in order to help rewire our industrial base, make sure the government's got the money to support nuclear, wind energy and other renewables and you know, make sure that we can help people and improve their lives as we go on this net zero journey. The good news I'd leave you with is that I know, having spoken with him recently about this subject, that the Chancellor is absolutely full square behind this, the Prime Minister is full square behind it, and it's very important, the election of Joe Biden in, in the United States, well, once Trump um, accepts the result, uh, because this is one main area where the UK and the US will be able to work very, very closely together and in an international sense, and we should never forget the international perspective, because of course, you know, the UK is, I think, under 2% of global emissions. In the international sense, the United States is so important. So us being able to lead with the United States on this issue is of huge ge uh, geopolitical importance and of importance to our planet. So thank you so much, and I'm very happy to take your question. Uh, wow, well, um, thank you very much. Um, that was a great scene setter for, for our net zero carbon day and it follows really well I think on from the uh, yesterday's opener from from Lord Deben. Um, now as I said earlier we do have five minutes now for some from audience Q&A for you Bim which um, as we all discovered yesterday on this event with Lord Deben it isn't very long at all so again what I'm going to do is I've, I'm going to pick um, about three questions out which have jumped out to me there are questions pouring in so apologies if i don't get that's them. right i will um, give i will i will give really short answers and break the habit of a lifetime right. i promise uh, that will help a lot so um first up we had a question that's come in from uh, benjamin williamson from uh, rebel recruiters um because you talked of adjusting the tax burden in your talk bim and um and ben asks uh, what are your thoughts on carbon taxes on uk products or on products coming from abroad to ensure we don't just offshore our negative contributions through purchasing from businesses who aren't held to account for, for their carbon footprint? Uh, quite simply, we, whatever we do to UK products, we need to somehow try and match that with things that we import from abroad. Because if we don't, then there's a real economic fairness issue with our own businesses and our own industry. Um, apart from the point you make, which is a very valid one around you know, offshoring bad stuff to poorer parts of the world. So frankly, we do need to think much more about how carbon taxes work. The difficulty with the carbon tax more broadly though, and it's worth making the point, is that getting the price right is something of immense difficulty uh, to do across the world. The way I think about it is I think the Western countries, if we could agree 
some sort of price, at least in the West, and that would help. Um, but it is difficult to do it. But we do need to make sure that we treat products from elsewhere in the world the same way as we treat our own. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had a few questions in uh, around, so I won't kind of name names, but we've had several questions come in around uh, the technology of, of hydrogen, um, green and blue hydrogen, and where that fits in, because you mentioned nuclear and, and wind as an integral part of our energy mix. Um, so where do you see hydrogen fitting into all of this? Yeah, I knew I'd get in trouble about this. So um, hydrogen is really important. And everybody um, over the last six months has really becoming very excited about it in government and in parliament. Um, what I would say is, by all means, we should uh, we should help push it. We should do pilot schemes. We should, in particular, for example, hydrogen, when you're dealing with um, very heavy industrial vehicles, electric um, batteries aren't strong enough. So hydrogen could be really important. However, some of that technology really still is emerging. And it's my view that when you have existing technology that can do the job, uh, or a large part of the job, you should definitely put your weight behind those first and strongly and help those new emerging technologies in hydrogen come along too. But look, I, um, I should have included hydrogen. Um, that's not deliberate beyond to say that I think we need to we need to back it and help. Mm. Fine. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, uh, next question we had to come in from uh, Carrie Loftus. Uh, Carrie asks, with governments uh, evolving and, and changing on a regular basis and therefore the policies, strategies and legislation all changing, how can we ensure that the whole country is on the right path to net zero in the timescales that are needed? Good question. There are parliamentary politics is pretty it's a pretty rough and tough business. It's like trench warfare a lot of the time. On this particular issue, it's probably got the least amount of disagreement across the house. So it, when it comes to net zero and on the impact on our environment, the debates people have are about the means and the speed rather than whether we should do something at all. There are very few areas of politics which are like that. And so I'm confident that on this area, if you know we ended up with a, I don't know, a Keir Starmer government in four years' time or whatever, I'm pretty confident that the the, the broader policy framework over the last 10 years would broadly speak. Oh, are you still there, Bim, or is it my connection that might have yeah. dropped? Yeah, you're still there. Sorry, yeah, I think here. you might have tried. Um, the last 10 seconds I just sort of missed there. Do you mind just repeating that very quickly? Uh, basically, most people in Parliament agree on this subject. So on this issue, I don't think there's going to be the chopping and changing that you might see in other policy areas. Right, got you. Okay, thank you. Um, quick question in uh, one that's coming from Barry Chattington. Um, and he talks about kind of homes and where, where sort of domestic housing stock fits into all of this. As he says, as 20 plus million homes in the UK have been proving to be the biggest contributor to greenhouse emissions. Um, how can you create the envy of energy saving, as he puts it? So a comment from you on, on the sort of domestic side of things. Uh, two aspects. You've got houses that or buildings should i say that already are built and buildings that you are building right now and in the future on the second on the latter it's easy because we need to set the right standards and make sure that those homes do not need to be retrofitted on the former it's harder and frankly we need to be putting in place very ambitious long-term plans for large numbers of people to go and retrofit and insulate and improve homes in terms of the retaining of energy. And the way how we sell this to people politically is we are, it's a social justice issue actually, because we will reduce your energy bills. And by reducing people's energy bills, I think that will be of considerable value to them. Uh, and, you know, we have to work out at what level we, we paid for. So for example, people who are very poor, we can expect them to pay for it themselves. People who are better off, I think they are gonna to have to pay for it themselves. We have to work out the timescales on how we do that. 
But that, I think, is, is something that's politically achievable and practically doable. But we've got to start soon. Thank you. And Bim, I know we've both used our time by a couple of minutes already, but I'm going to close with one final question, if I may, just to get a 30 second uh, answer from you on this one. And it's to do with kind of COP26, obviously with 2021 now being a really crucial year for, for climate action. I just wanted to get your views on how much of an opportunity you believe those climate talks hold then for businesses and governments to increase awareness, accelerate action and, and drive more collaboration around energy management and, and carbon reduction. Um it obviously provides a huge, broad, macro political opportunity with lots of cameras and lots of press. I am instinctively sceptical about these set piece events, though, and I don't mean around the efforts that people put into them, but these events in and of themselves don't achieve anything. They only matter because of the actions that people take. So my focus is we, need, we, can't, we shouldn't be waiting for an event to do something or do something for a particular event. We need to have the right policy over the medium long term, just as, as Carrie was describing in relation to, to, to different political parties' attitudes to it. That's what we need to be focusing on and engaging with countries from all over the world all the time, not just for COP26. But COP26 does give us an opportunity in particular with the United States with a new president. Thank goodness. Mm. Exactly. Uh, well said. Bim Apalami, uh, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to hear from you this thank morning. You. And I must really say, enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the entire uh, virtual event audience, um, yeah, thanks for your time.